All right, so we're going to get started again and start in part three, uh, which is contextualizing blackness. All right. You can go to the next slide. We can go to the next slide. Here we go. All right, so I want us to think, um, think about blackness um, and black experience and black struggle through a historical vantage point um, before we think about our present moment. Um, obviously, you know, the first 20 Africans that were brought over for labor were brought in 1619, right? Initially as indentured servants officially, so they were actually alongside English indentured servants and others initially, and so if there was a brief moment um, where you have um, white people and black people, and they would say Africans at that time, right, not black people, being um, oppressed um, and sharing a lot of things in common, but that only lasts like one generation. Um, and, and race is used to wedge uh, people that have a lot in common and to, to divide them so that um, poor white people who are being exploited by the system actually begin to identify with the very people that are exploiting them rather than the people that have more shared experience with them. And so um, this idea of race kind of develops out of that um, reality in the US. It's an estimated 12.5 million African people who are forcibly stolen from their homelands and taken over to the Americas um, for forced labor and enslavement. Um, Anti-blackness um, is developed in opposition, right? It's oppositionally framed um, to whiteness. And we don't always think about that so that it is becomes a symbol of inferiority as it's growing, ugliness, rebellion, and danger, um, and particularly heathen status, right, before God, right? All these things uh, are part of the kind of racial framework that's developing um, during slavery. Black bodies in particular then are bodies that are said to be in need of mastery and control, right? The rightly ordered society is one in which black bodies are being mastered and controlled. So there's actually a theological framework in place also around blackness. Next slide. Of course, um, the middle passage um, alone, right, when you're thinking about just the transformation of people's lived experiences, right, in terms of at one point, living in their homeland, they're grabbed, they're taken on the ship, and that from that point forward, they're identified and treated not as human beings, but as property, right? Um, the whole racial hierarchical system all gets fused into the slave ship. That is their learning period. Um, and for, you know, it could be weeks, like four weeks, up to all the way up to three months it could take, um, depending on the, you know, the waves and the winds, in terms of this journey um, to the Americas where um, millions literally don't make it across. Millions die in the Atlantic, right? Uh, many thrown overboard, many die from diseases uh, that would come from being, um, you know, no sanitation, space, or anything. it's just filthy, dirty, um, the way that people are kind of shoved into those spaces. And so, um, but that is a, a learning period, right, of the whole hierarchical system is in place there on the slave ship. Next slide. Post-slavery, um, so technically post-slavery begins in 1865. Um, at the end of the Civil War. Um, obviously, right after the Civil War, there's the brief period of reconstruction in which there's actual, um, at least some efforts by our government to try to create opportunities and schools and loans and potential opportunities for African Americans to participate in the society and there's actual government oversight in some of those things. We could talk about some of the limits of, of how it went down, but certainly that was probably the most invested the government has ever been in terms of actually trying to create opportunity for African Americans in our society. Um, but that is short lived, it's about a decade long and then um, the government removes its efforts for those things and there is full-blown backlash against black people um, after the Civil War. 
black codes are created. Black codes basically are just ways in which black peoples, it just became illegal to be human, right? Uh, we talk today about black while walking, black while driving, black while holding Skittles and iced tea. Well, in some ways that was all being legalized, right? Just uh, laws on the books, loitering, right? Not getting permission to change jobs by a, from a white person, right? Talking to a white woman, right? All these things could be punished by law. We're on the books um, through many black codes uh, throughout the South. Um, but the reason why I said before kind of slavery ended at that time is because there's a whole bunch of neo-slavery that emerged in its context, right? So at the end of formal slavery, official legalized slavery, comes the convict leasing system, um, which you have, you know, uh, estimates of up to 200,000 people that are kind of basically, I don't know if you know how much you know about the convict leasing system, but basically uh, black people, you could be, you, you get fined for loitering, you get taken to the court system. Um, the big issue isn't that you go into the court system, it's that you have no money, you're poor broke, and so you can't afford the court fees. So what they're gonna do, they're gonna lease you to these various institutions. Don't worry, you can pay it off. Some people for minor infractions spend decades working for institutions with no oversight or whatever. Many people are whipped, beaten, killed. Um, again, this is actually cheaper labor than slavery often, often costs. There's sharecropping and, and um, peonage and chain gangs, right? There's all these different forms of neo-slavery that emerge post-slavery, which is why it seems almost disingenuous to say slavery really ended in 1865. Um, it just took on new forms uh, as society reorganized itself. Um, and much of that went on, like convict leasing system, it wasn't until like during the Civil War that the government made convict leasing systems illegal, right? Um, so that continued for a very long time, sharecropping much through the 20th century as well, um, much further than that. Jim Crow, of course, we know all about. Most people often say to my students, my students, um, they come into, I teach a class called The Politics of Blackness. It's a first year seminar course. We look at black struggle from slavery to the present day. And I say that they come to my class and they think about the 20th century and they think about um, the 20th century mainly, mainly about uh, water fountains, right? And they think that the 20th century was a fight over wa water fountains. And I said, you know, if you think that that was like the heart of the issue, then you've missed what was actually going on, the way that entire societies were organized, right? Um, control people's movement and participation and all that stuff. Um, the, the, the water fountains are just a small, manifestation, the outward small manifestation of a white supremacist system that was created. Um, if it was just about water fountains, then maybe we overacted a little bit, right? Um, if that's all it was. But if it was a whole white supremacist system, then you can understand why people um, fought the way that they did and responded and struggled in the way that they did as well. Next slide. Uh, of course, um, post-slavery um, lynching was also a reality um, as well, right? Oftentimes, uh, we think about post-slavery, uh, we don't realize that, that lynching wasn't actually, at least for black people, was hardly done during slavery, right? It was after slavery when lynching was done. Um, and so in the early uh, periods, there were mass lynchings where thousands of white people uh, would gather and they would actually, it would be like a large spectacle, almost like a town fair, and they would um, come to see a black person lynched, and it would be advertised in the, new, in the paper, everybody knew about it, um, and people would send you know, postcards and stuff uh, about what was going on. Um, eventually, it became a stigmatized thing to do out in the public square, so then it became a thing that white people did at night. Um, in smaller groups, not large groups in the thousands. Um, and so you have stories like Mary Turner. Mary Turner was eight months pregnant. Her husband had been previously lynched. She went to the courthouse to complain. <coughs> and they took her, they took her out, hung her up naked by her feet, cut open her stomach, let the baby fall out, and stomped the baby to death and lynched her. Right? Just inhumane, horrifying things that were done. Um, 1919 in Little Rock, there were 237 people killed. 237 people killed um, in that race riot. Overall, there's, there were about estimated 5,000 black men, women, 
and children lynched um, well again into the 20th century, well into the 20th century. Lynching was a form of terrorism. Uh, early lynchings, again, were public spectacles attracting sometimes thousands of people. Um, but in all cases, lynchers <coughs> were not usually prosecuted, and if they were, they were uh, usually acquitted by the jury. And I think, you know, James Cone is right when he says that, um, you know, those who want to, you know, look on the old rugged cross and can't first understand its relationship to the, the crucified of this land, right? Those who've been lynched in our society, um, that that actually is our closest window into what crucifixion actually meant and looked like um, in Jesus's time, both used as public spectacles, both used as means of terrorism, both means to set people in place and let them know what happens if you step out of line, right? Um, and so crucifixion of the first century for Jewish people, there were thousands, Jesus was not the only one crucified, right? There were thousands of Jews crucified by the Roman Empire and in many ways um, uh, for us to recognize the ways in which Jesus who hung on that tree um, also in many ways experienced and understood and co-suffered as uh, a, a lynched victim in some ways as well and to think about what that means and how that maybe shapes the ways that we might domesticate our own faith, our own cross, and hopefully it will change the way that we see the crucified of our land today, right? Those who are most victimized and brutalized in our society today. Um, yeah. Next slide. In the 50s, um, Emmett Till's case um, kind of reverberated through American society. Of course, Emmett Till was a boy from Chicago, I think he was 14 at the time, um, who was down seeing his uncle in Mississippi, and he gets taken at night, right, by the three white men who beat him, brutalize him, um, torture him, um, eventually throw him into the river. Um, and it's his mom, Mammy Till, who decides that, uh, she ain't gonna let this, this one slide um, and go in the dark, right? And so she decides that she was gonna have it publicized, I believe it was by Jet Magazine, um, put it on the front cover of Jet Magazine so that the world could see what they did to her boy. And that image seared into the minds of everybody. And later, you know, folks like Rosa Parks would talk about how it impacted her, and other, you know, SNCC leaders would talk about how it impacted them. Um, and same thing with Jimmy Lee Jackson. Um, the Montgomery bus boycott was actually, um, a lot of people, we just think about, you know, the voting rights, but it actually was a lot of it, like the actual march itself was organized because they wanted to take his body that had been killed by a police officer and march it down to the Capitol and show them what they had done, right? Um, and so there's ways in which um, their deaths sparked the frustration for their generations, right? Um, it sparked anger um, and a determined focus to, to struggle for justice in our society. And I think it's important to honor both uh, their names, right, but also the people presently, um, people who are being killed presently because of the anti-black policies and practices of our society today, um, that some people's names, for whatever reason, stare into our minds in particular ways. Um, and you, we can't undo that, but we certainly can remember them and allow that to, to keep our drive, right? Um, I think about Vincent Harding's talk about there's a river flowing, right? To be join this river of struggle and resistance um, in the midst of all those who've lost their lives. Next. I wanted us, yeah, I'm sorry. I want us to think a little bit about um, this history of anti-black violence. And so I thought um, a few quotes from Martin Luther King to, you know, sometimes people, for whatever reason, can only hear from Dr. King. So I figure to let people know, even Dr. King spoke on these things during his time. He wasn't just speaking, I have a dream, but he had a lot more to say than that. Um, he witnessed this kind of anti-black violence as well. He says this, uh, I had passed spots where Negroes had been savagely lynched and had watched the Ku Klux Klan on its right rides at night. I'd seen police brutality with my own eyes and watched Negroes receive the most tragic injustice in the courts, right? He's witnessing this whole wide 
um, system of injustice and oppression. He says also, the economic plight of the masses of Negroes has worsened, the gap between the wages of the Negro worker and those of the white worker has widened, slums are worse, and Negroes attend more thoroughly segregated schools today than in 1954. He's writing that in 1967 when everybody imagines that everything got fixed, right? He's not seeing it as everything got fixed. He's seeing greater problems emerging. Next quote. There's a couple more quotes. Um, in response to the pervasive anti-black frames and sentiments, he began eventually to see the need to speak positively about blackness, right? Um, moving, not only talking about Negroes, but talking about black people, right? And, and, and blackness in a positive way. He says this, quote, I'm black, but I'm black and beautiful. This, this self-affirmation is the black man's need made compelling by the white man's crimes against him, right? Um, that, that the response to anti-black, blackness and white supremacy is that there has to be a doubling down to reaffirm people's psychological attacks and assaults against their own humanity. He goes on and he says, the problem that we face is that we, that the ghetto is a domestic colony that's constantly drained without being replenished. And you are always telling us to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps, and yet we are being robbed every day. Put something back in the ghetto. Again, that's from 1967. And finally, the last quote is, and so we still have a long, long way to go before we reach the promised land of freedom, right? Dr. King saw that there was a long way to go. And this is, again, at the end of his life, he didn't see it as we're getting there, um, but that we had a very long way to go. Um, and I, I only bring Dr. King up because I think he gets used so often to try to um, re-narrate that somehow, either through his 1963 I Have a Dream speech or somehow in his death that he magically fixed everything, he doesn't narrate that himself, and so I think it would be unfair and unjust to use his words in that kind of way. Um, let's continue on. Next slide. So in 1970, um, it's been documented quite a bit, just the shifts and things that have happened post-civil rights and some of the present challenges that we face. Um, of course, um, probably the best example that has gotten a lot of conversation is um, the rise of mass incarceration post-1970, right? So in, the seven, in 1970, about 1970, the pop, prison population is about 300,000 people, and then in just three decades, it explodes to over two million people, right? <coughs> Making the United States the largest prison population in the, United, in the world. Um, we see uh, police brutality and anti-black criminalization still going on, um, which has been going on for a very long time. We still see deep poverty, inequitable and failing education systems, lack of affordable quality housing. Still, black people are still the last hired and the first fired. Um, there's a lack of affordable and preventative health care, and we could go on and on and on about all these realities, and all of them, again, having their origins um, centuries and decades in the making. Next slide. I want to specifically um, put some more context on the conversation around police brutality and racial profiling. Um, because I think sometimes we don't have any historical context to talk about some of the things that are happening in our present day. So here are some facts that I think can help us think through um, contextualizing some of what's been going on. Um, so starting back from 1920 to 1932, more than half of all African Americans killed by white people were killed by police officers, right? So in the early 20th century, there's this already this very old problem of police violence and murder that was going on in black communities. The majority of black community riots from 1943 to 1972 were precipitated by black people being killed or harassed by police, right? So this idea that black people just now are suddenly rioting but hadn't before and that we're not doing the same way is not really true. Black people have been rioting for a very long time, all the way through the mid-20th century in response to police brutality specifically. Um, and so it's been a historical reality that, that has been around for a very long time that needs to be acknowledged. In 1999, 42% of the black community reported having been racially profiled. Meanwhile, 72% of young black men reported having been racially profiled, right? So we're talking about large segments of the black community that is experiencing ongoing racial profiling in their own communities. 
In New York City, their stop and frisk practices were studied from 2010 to 2012. Some of you might be familiar with some of the New York City cases. It eventually got deemed illegal what they were doing, right? Um, but it got, it got studied, and what they found was that 84% of the stops were comprised of blacks and Latinos, but only 6% resulted in actual arrests, right? So the assumption is, is that cops just have good intuition. They know they just have the eye. They know who the bad guy is, right? Um, but the reality is that they're just harassing people over and over and over again in their communities, brutalizing them, humiliating them. Sometimes the same person can, can be stopped and frisked multiple times in a day in their own neighborhood, right? Um, and so you have only a tiny percent of all that harassment and humiliation is actually coming up with people actually uh, having done anything uh, des deserving arrest anyway. Um, and so that's part of the reason why it was deemed un unconstitutional, because they were actually m making mandatory minimums for how many people need to be stopped in particular communities, in black and Latino communities, but they weren't practicing that same method all around New York City. It was just black and Latino communities. Um, and so again, we can see the ways that these things are institutionalized and made into policies that disproportionately harm and threaten the lives of black people. And then finally, there are steep racial disparities in the policing and criminal justice system, and we can see this pervasively, right? At every single stage, from policy to neighborhood policing practices, to stop and searches, to arrests, to sentencing, and even after time is served, there are demonstrable racial disparities, right? At every single stage, um, it's not just at one point. It's not just police interacting um, with people in which that there's disparities at every single stage, including after people are have done their time, and then and then our society won't hire them and can legally discriminate them because they have to check the box, right? Um, all those things are realities, and so um, it's thoroughly creates, as Michelle Alexander calls, all right, a caste system um, after people have served their time in our society. Next. I won't go into all the different stories, but I mean, I've, I've, I tell in the book, I tell a story about my brother being um, fitting the description and getting picked up for basically because he had a black t-shirt and blue jeans and that they were looking for a black man with black t-shirt and blue jeans and he got arrested and spent a few months locked up pre-trial before them finding out that it wasn't him. Um, I talk about my brother at the end of the book about, I mean myself, about having guns pointed on me in a local traffic stop, right? Um, um, because apparently I guess I, I was a threat. Um, my younger brother, nine years younger than me, who he lives in more in a white suburban community now, and he has just constant stories of just racial profiling. I mean, this, this my brother cannot get a break. He's just constantly being profiled. Um, he just, yeah. Um, I've seen my neighbor, um, uh, this is in Philly, um, my neighbors after, he was loud that night, but they arrested him, he was not fighting or anything, and they had him handcuffed to the ground, shoving his face into the cement, just, he's screaming in pain, and they would not relent, and just witnessing that kind of stuff up close, right? Um, and then there's Darren Manning in Philadelphia, 14-year-old boy coming after school, um, and <coughs> top-notch student coming out after basketball practice with friends. He gets stopped by some cops, and a white female officer grabs his testicles and squeezes so hard that he has to go. And I think it got like ruptured, basically, and he had to have surgery um, afterwards. Um, but then no charges, right? She was not held accountable for those actions. Um, and so when people live and experience these kind of things daily and regularly, um, you know, um, to understand why people are frustrated, even aside from those who are being killed, right? Like that's just the tip of the iceberg of a constant just humiliation and brutalizing and, and, and dehumanizing encounters regularly. Next slide. I want us to think a little bit about blackness itself, the idea of blackness, <coughs> and how do we think about blackness? Um, and I think that, for me, there's three kind of ways that I think about it. Um, there's ways in which we can think about blackness in terms of the ways, in terms of black stereotypes, right? Um, and the ways that black people can internalize the ways that they're told, right? Black stereotypes are, are basically is who white society says black people are, right? 
Dhamma culture says, this is who you are. You are lazy, you are unintelligent, you're criminal, you're dangerous, you're welfare queens, you're all these things, right? That's who dominant society says, it's the stereotypes. Um, and that's one way of thinking about blackness, right? We could think about it on that layer. Um, there's another way of thinking about blackness, um, and that's thinking about black archetypes, right? Um, and so this is, uh, this is who dominant culture says you ought to be. Not who dominant culture says you are, but who, who do they say you ought to be, right? This is the standard. You need to be um, more, some from the 90s, more Michael Jordan, less Allen Iverson, right? Smile more, cut the cornrows, no tats, right? More Michael Jordan, less less Allen Iverson, you can get your endorsements that way, right? You can sell some, some Coca-Cola, some French fries. Um, and so that's the archetype, right? Or for a while before Bill Cosby was exposed as, you know, a predator, um, people would say, look, be more like the, the Huxtables, right? That would have been the standard, right? Be, this is the standard that you ought to be um, striving towards. <coughs> the ster stereotypes, archetypes. Um, but I think what's important is, of course, blackness, the actual reality is that black people aren't merely just who we're told we are or who we're told we ought to be, though those things can certainly influence us, right? But blackness is also about um, the antitypes, right? The resisting of defining yourself from external sources. Um, it, but instead, uh, resist it, as you resist those dominant cultural definitions of oneself, you embrace your own humanity and perspectives on blackness uh, through a process of self-discovery and communal practice, right, and sharing and understanding. In the context of community, um, one can kind of figure out um, one's own individuality as well as one's place in the broader community that they participate in. Um, but it's an anti-type, right? It's a refusal to be um, defined externally by an outside source. Um, and I think that thinking about blackness and the, the threats and the temptations to internalize dominant cultural definitions um, are real things that I think have to be thought about um, if we're going to talk about blackness and what it's meant and the threats that come not only in terms of the physical threats but the psychological threats that are just as real and, is, and need to be addressed um, in our communities. I want us uh, to think about Hebrews 11, 23 to 27. And there it says, by faith when Moses was born, his parents hid him for three months because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith when he grew up, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be ill-treated with the people of God than to enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. He regarded abuse suffered for Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for his eyes were fixed on the reward. By faith he left Egypt without fearing the king's anger, for he persevered as though he could see the one who is invisible. It's an interesting story. I mean, it starts by recounting, obviously, Moses' experience, but really starting with his parents, right? And his parents' uh, decision to... to <coughs> to reject the king's edict, right? They were not afraid. They, they cared for their child so much that they were not afraid, that they were willing to be civilly disobedient, right? That they were not gonna fall in line with what the broader society was doing and they were gonna do what they needed to protect their child. In doing that, they had somehow embedded some kind of seed, I think, in Moses, right? Because Moses would go on later to not wanna be identified by by Pharaoh's daughter, by Pharaoh's daughter and the court, right? The elites, the Egyptian world that he had been raised in. And instead he wanted to align himself in solidarity with those who were being oppressed, right? His Israelite brothers and sisters. Um, and so he chose to align with them, to suffer alongside of them, and to join them in seeking liberation outside of Egypt's oppression that they were experiencing. And it says that he regarded that suffering greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt because ultimately he had a, a greater posture, right? He had a faith that had fixed his eyes on something greater than what he could see at the moment, right? His, the temporal realities, they didn't look good. It looked like, like, like everything looked bad and yet nonetheless he was pressing on towards something much greater than that. And it says that he left without fearing the king's anger, for he could per persevere as though he could see the one who is invisible, right? That was ultimately what was pressing his faith to, 
to act, even though everything in his circumstances looked to seem like everything was not going in his favor. And so he was able to make the act in faith. But I believe that the thing that I want us to focus on um, primarily is none of those things per se, but it's actually going back to the first verse, right? Which is uh, that it says that the parents saw that the child was beautiful, right? And we could, we kinda, kinda, you could kind of skip that and miss how that plays into the kind of ways that you might respond to the sufferings and injustices of others, right? Um, that, he, that they saw that the child was beautiful. And I think when, when I talk about race and I talk about the ways that race is a way of seeing and being seen in the world, right? Um, it shifts and changes how we view other people. In some ways, um, anti-blackness, it dehumanizes people and says that they're not worth much. But to say that they saw that the child was beautiful was to see the image of God inherent in Moses, right? To see that he was made, that he was beautiful was to see his worth and his value, that he was precious and that his life uh, deserved to flourish and to, to go on and to thrive. Uh, and so I, I think about, you know, situations in our recent history. Um, and I wonder what would have happened had people seen black people and seeing them as, as, um, as beautiful, right? As worthy of, of, and invaluable. I think about Mike Brown and I remember the actual words that the police officer said, right? He actually said, he looked like a demon coming towards me, a demon. So he couldn't see that, that Mike Brown was beautiful. I think about Tamir Rice, right? Young child, right? And they made their say, oh, he looked like a grown man or something. 12-year-old child. They could not see that this child was beautiful. I think about Renisha McBride had an accident looking for somebody to just help her out. Knocks on the door. Mr. Wafer opens the door. Screen door still locks. He shoots her through the screen door immediately. He could not see that this child was beautiful. And I think that, that if we're going to... Um, be serious about particularly dealing with anti-black racism and the power of it. It has to be a change way of seeing human beings and particularly blackness, right? That we have to, there's been Christian formation done to help us see distortedly. And we need to fix and think about our Christian formation that will change the way that we see each other and will then Naturally, the outflow will be that we will respond with acts of justice, striving for peace and shalom and the well-being of our neighbors um, and, and those in our communities. And so I really think that we have to take seriously if anti-blackness is a way of not seeing people's humanity, of not seeing their shared humanity, not seeing their worth, of not recognizing that people are beautiful, um, that we need to take seriously the task of, of fostering and forming eyes that see um, people's value and worth and how precious they truly are. Um, let's skip to two verses. We're going to skip that, um, and we're going to go to our questions. And my computer's not working all right. Well, you guys can read because my, my laptop is freezing up on me. So you guys can read those questions and, um, and discuss and dialogue together, and then um, I believe um, that will be it. I, I do want to mention real quick, just if anybody's interested, I do have some copies of Trouble I've Seen available, $15 if you want to get it. They're also available online, um, anywhere you can find them online as well. All right, thank you.